You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. And I'm just about to head out to Dallas myself for our meetup here, which will be really cool. I'm hoping a number of you will be there and I can meet you in person. At any rate, before we begin the show, as I always do, I want to remind you there's other ways to get involved with this community. Uh, You can go to the wealthformula.com website. That's a great site to get additional resources and also sign up for our various lists, including the Accredited Investor Club, which is where really, I mean, you know, we learn a lot of principles and personal finance and all that kind of stuff, but that's uh, that's kind of where... The action happens if you uh, meet the criteria as an accredited investor. You should check that out at wealthformula.com. Now, as far as today's show goes, you know, it's interesting. I keep keep hearing in the podcast ecosystem or people I've been talking to, boring is good when it comes to investing. And, you know, I've been, uh, that's been my mantra now for, gosh, five years. So I've I've started hearing other echo, others echo that statement lately, and I'm not sure if I had something to do with it, but I'm glad that message is spreading in this uh, podcast ecosystem, at least. You know, I used to be perhaps uh, the busiest cosmetic surgeon in Chicago a decade ago. It's a, v- a different life, kind of crazy to imagine that's who I was, that's what I was doing. You know, I worked hard, I got great results, you know. When the economy was good, I was crushing it. I mean, for especially for a guy who was uh, in his mid-30s and that kind of thing. I mean, I made my first million bucks that way. But from, uh, from the outside, you know, the cosmetic surgery field in general, it's glamorized, right? And clearly looks very sexy. And so do med spas with Botox and fillers and laser procedures and all that. But I could tell you, from insider knowledge that it's hard to make money in these fields unless you have a competitive uh, advantage over others. And in my case, I did. And that's that I was a pretty good marketer and I was good at, uh, and we had a huge marketing budget. I went all in TV, radio, internet, such. That being the case, most people don't have the, the coronary artery capacity to, to do that uh, because I was spending a lot of money. i I really didn't, I couldn't afford, but it paid out. Uh, But that said, when the economy goes south and these kinds of procedures become less important because people got to buy food and shelter, pay their rent, all that stuff. And that's when boring prevails and boring prevails and boring prevails when in good times too, by the way, you just don't, you know, no one's really paying any attention. You know, you sell widgets, you're massively profitable, but you sell widgets Okay, so, you know, nothing you can talk about at parties. No one's going to look at you and think you're super cool widget guy, but you're winning. You know, boring businesses involve unsexy things. I don't even know if that's a word, unsexy, but that's what boring businesses involve, unsexy things like cleaning or selling widgets or widgets that can make widgets. You know, as boring as it sounds, these are the kinds of businesses that do well over time and make life easier. And even if you think about what we do mostly, right, we have apartment buildings, people have to live somewhere, and there's these large apartment complexes that we own in an investor club. These are all small businesses, and what they do, they provide people a place to live. Kind of boring, but hey, it works. But most of this stuff, you know, the boring stuff, out there is in the background, right? And so you may say, okay, I'm interested in boring stuff, but where do I go? Places where people would not normally look, that's where you would go. Uh, But if you can find these golden nuggets, you can, you could potentially make a fortune and uh, laugh yourself to the bank because you're so boring. You know, computer chips uh, are a great example of widgets, really, at the end of the day. I mean, no one thinks computer, I don't think computer chips are very sexy. You know, I am a computer chip guy. You know, it doesn't sound like something I'd say at the bar, but computer chips have become critical in society today. Just think about the computer cell phone's Really, anything requires any sort of, you know, digital technology involves chips. And you must have computer chips to to live 
in our modern day society. And so that being said, computer chips, as boring as they sound, have practically become, you know, one of the most valuable commodities in the world, right? And, and trade is really important and it's dictating not only, you know, the economy, macroeconomics, but also geopolitics and military. Anyway, uh, this may sound, well, you know, to show about chips, but I'm telling you, it's kind of cool. And it's fascinating to think about this kind of stuff. And my guest today is uh, an expert in this space. He's written a book called Chip War, the Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. And you're going to want to listen to this interview when we come back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula podcast is Chris Miller. Chris is an associate professor of international history at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Uh, Gene Patrick, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and Eurasia director at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He's the author of The Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. So welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for having me. So I know the first thing, what, we're going to start basic here, right? Because I, I got a lot of you know smart people in their you know 50s and 60s who've never really spent time trying to really understand what what the deal with, we know we use computers every day. We have, uh, we know the po how powerful they are and we hear the, you know, words for the, um, you know, how much energy or uh, how much, how much power a computer has, but w what exactly is a chip? So a chip is a piece of material, usually of silicon that has, uh, thousands, millions, or in some cases, billions of tiny electrical circuits carved into it. And those circuits are called transistors, and they are either on or off. If they're on, they produce a one. If they're off, they produce a zero. And these are the ones and zeros that undergird all software and all computing. So you can't have computing. You can't have memory without chips. Got it. And you call the uh, you computer chips the most critical technology in the world. Is that, is that right? Tell That's us That's correct. Yeah, well, we've become so reliant on computer chips that our economy, our societies can't function without them. It's not only computers or data centers that have chips inside. Your phone, for example, will have, in many cases, a dozen different chips, not only the main processor that runs the operating system, but a chip managing the camera, one managing the Wi-Fi connection, another managing the wireless connection. Your car could have dozens, in some cases, hundreds of chips inside your dishwasher, your microwave, almost anything you touch with an on-off switch has a chip inside. And that means that they're crucially important to our everyday lives as well as right. to our economy. Uh, and that's why it's so dangerous that their production is all concentrated in Taiwan. Got it. And when, I guess one more background thing is you talk about, you know, obviously the number of chips is important. Chips also change over time in terms of technology too, right? Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how that how that evolves? That's right. Yeah. There's a, a prediction known as Moore's law, which is not right. a law of physics. It's just a, a projection going forward, which was made in 1965 and projected that the number of these tiny circuits that could be put on a chip would grow exponentially, double every two years or so. And since the 1960s, that has been borne out. And the result of that is that the amount of computing power on each chip doubles each year as well. So if you've got a chip that's 10 years old, it is far, far behind in terms of the amount of computing power it can produce. And that's the fundamental force that's given us computers today in everything we use. That's the reason why computers in the 1950s took up the size of a, a large room, whereas today you can have more computing power than within that room in a tiny chip in your pocket. Right. So there's really two things. There's, I guess, the, the um, you know, where the chips are going, who gets them, and also the technology uh, involved as well. So th these, obviously we have, so we have this background, right? We know we require chips for pretty much everything that we're used to in modern society now. And I guess the question is, how do you, um, you know, how do you relate that uh, it's almost like a commodity then, right? For the, for the global economy. Is that, is that fair? 
in some ways that's fair. It's it's like a commodity in the sense that we can't live without it, but it's right. not like a commodity in the sense that producing them is extraordinarily complicated and a tiny number of companies monopolize their production. So oil, there's lots of countries that have oil. The Saudis have more of it, but the Saudis produce 10 or so percent of global oil production. Russia and the US, something similar. By contrast, uh, Taiwan produces 90% of the most advanced processor chips, without which Apple as a company simply could not function. And then the machines used to produce chips are also monopolized by a small number of companies. For example, there's one company in the Netherlands called ASML, which produces 100% of the world's extreme ultraviolet lithography machines, which are extraordinarily complicated tools, without which it's impossible to make a chip. So it's like commodities in the sense that we need them, but it's very unlike commodities in the sense that they're monopolized by a small number of players and far more geographically concentrated than oil. Just to give you one other example, you know, Taiwan produces 90% of the world's most advanced processors. OPEC in aggregate, the Saudis, the Qataris, mm -hmm. all the other members of OPEC produce less than 40% of the world's right. oil. So this is much more vulnerability, much more yeah. concentration. So along that lines, let's talk about, you know, what dynamic that creates, because obviously, you know, Taiwan is a, uh, is a is a place that's sort of uh, on the target uh, of China. Um, what uh, I mean, I, I'm sure, or maybe they're not. I don't know, but I'm sure uh, government U.S. government is quite cognizant of that fact. Why can't we create more chip creating centers? Like, why can't, why can't we bring that domestically? Or is it one of those things? where it's low cost labor and and that's what we're trying what you need to to produce these things you know it's it's not primarily about labor costs because a chip making facility has some workers inside but far more expensive are the machines that are inside of it and the most expensive of the machines inside a chip making facility can cost 150 million dollars a piece so it's it's really a machinery cost that drives the cost of chip making and to build one advanced chip manufacturing facility can cost $20 billion. So these are the most expensive factories in human history. And so moving production from Taiwan or other centers of production like Korea, elsewhere in the world is just brutally expensive. Uh, it would take hundreds of billions of dollars to fully move the industry away from East Asia towards the US. But what's more is that it's not simply a question of movement because the Taiwanese company that produces the world's most advanced chips, TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, is better than everyone else in the world. No one else can do what they can do on the island of Taiwan. So even if you had the funds to build a whole suite of new advanced chipmaking facilities in the U.S. to make up for the capacity that's produced in Taiwan, we still wouldn't be able to do it as accurately and with as much precision as the Taiwanese can. Just again, as a little background, wh wh why did this all concentrate in Taiwan? And because am I wrong in saying that if you go back in the history of, of computing, that U.S. historically was the dominant producer initially? That's right. The first ships were invented in the United States and right. Texas and also in in the towns south of Silicon Valley, uh, south of San Francisco that at the time weren't known as Silicon Valley, but now are. Mm -hmm. um, but over the past couple of decades, um, production has shifted largely because, for two reasons. One, governments in East Asia, especially in Taiwan and South Korea, and then now increasingly China, have poured billions of dollars into incentivizing the shifting of manufacturing. So that's one big reason. Secondly, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Morris Chang who founded the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company in 1987. And before that, he'd spent 30 years working in the U.S. chip industry um, and was really at the at the pinnacle of, of his career when he moved to Taiwan. And he had an insight that no one else in the U.S. chip industry did, which was that the business model of making semiconductors was shifting. In the past, most companies designed and manufactured chips in-house. The same company did both the design and the manufacturing. In 1987, Morris Chang founded TSMC on the insight that if you only focused on manufacturing chips, you could serve a broad array of customers, manufacture a higher volume of chips, learn more from your higher production volumes, and therefore produce chips more efficiently and with more precision as a result. And that's been the business model of the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company since that date. And that's been why it's been able to grow far faster uh, than any competitor, whether in Korea and Japan and the US, anywhere else in the world.
So you've set up a, you know, essentially a um, uh, geopolitical and ultimately and also macroeconomic uh, scenario there. Um, what's happening at, at that level that uh, in, in terms of, you know, China's role, you got China, you've got Taiwan. Um, tell us kind of what's happening in that space right now and, you know, what scares you or what you're encouraged about. Well, the situation right now is that the entire world is reliant on Taiwan, the U.S., Europe, Japan, China. Everyone needs the chips that only Taiwan can produce. Taiwan itself is hugely dependent on chip making. Over 40 percent of Taiwan's exports are semiconductors. And they largely go to China where they're assembled into servers, into computers, into smartphones that are then re-exported worldwide. Both the U.S. and the Chinese military are dependent on chips from TSMC. The U.S. military can access them legally. The Chinese military, we know from many studies, has ways of accessing those chips illegally. And as a result, both the U.S. and the Chinese military are building up their capabilities to fight over Taiwan with the chips produced by TSMC. Now, the U.S. is trying to change this by further restricting the types of chips that can be sent to China, and TSMC is subject to many U.S. export control rules. So over time, China will have less access to the chips that TSMC produces. But that creates a different type of risk, which is that China will try to gain access, or at least to cut the U.S. off, by attacking Taiwan. And if there were to be a war in the Taiwan Straits, the disruption to the chip industry on that island would be almost certainly complete, in which case we'd find it impossible to build a smartphone anywhere in the world the next year to say nothing of PCs or telecoms infrastructure or data centers. The cost would be enormous, measured in the trillions of dollars, I think worse probably than the economic cost of COVID and the subsequent lockdowns. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a big deal, right? I mean, uh, could the U.S. remain um, the number one economy in the world if uh, it doesn't domestically dominate the chip market eventually? Well, it's, it's a question mark. I think in the past, we've seen that many of the advances across society, not only in the tech sector, but more broadly, have been driven by computing power, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in automobiles, whether it's in consumer goods, computing power is crucial and computing power means chips. And if you think about actually next generation technology, take the cars of five years from now versus the cars of five years ago, they're going to be even more reliant on computing, on sensing, on memory, and that means chips. And if you contrast a Tesla to um, uh, a, 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 another type of car today, what you'll find is Teslas have more chips, more advanced yeah. chips in them as a result. So I think it's hard to imagine that there won't continue to be a really close correlation between the amount of computing power you can produce and get access to and the fate of your economy more generally. There was a, uh, there was an, a, the CHIPS Act, right? Which was, I guess, a $53 billion direct investment. Um, tell us about the impact on the U.S. chip sector there. Is that, um, is that just not enough? Is it, I mean, what? That's right. It's just not enough. It, yeah. That'll buy you two chip making facilities, um, more or less. It's a good start. I think it's the right move. It's a recognition that we've become yeah. dangerously, horrifyingly reliant on Taiwan, but it's only barely going to move the needle. And I think there's more to be done, both in terms of reducing the cost gap of producing in the U.S. versus producing in other countries in um, pushing back against unfair subsidies that other, gov other governments are giving their chip industries. Uh, and then also in making sure that U.S. technology is not leaking abroad and being used to uh, support in particular the Chinese military, where we know the Chinese military has pretty widespread access to advanced U.S. designed, U.S. made chips. Right. And along that lines, too, I mean, I guess the, the question is, um, is there an argument to uh, advocate for subsidization of a U.S. chip market um, uh, production so that we can encourage this? And are you seeing any signs of that? You know, I think it's an interesting uh it's an interesting and complicated balance that must be struck. Uh, on the one hand, there's no doubt that chip making over the past 60 years has been driven forward by private actors far more successfully than the government. The government's played a role in funding R&D and funding science, but it's been companies that have uh, really found uh, ways to produce chips the most efficiently. So 
it'd be wrong, I think, for us to want the government to start playing a much bigger role in the industry. But so long as every other government in the world is providing incentives to manufacture in their countries, the U.S. can't simply fall behind. Uh, and the reality is that everyone else in the world, Europe, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, and most importantly, China is pouring money in. And the Chinese are pouring not only billions, but probably hundreds of billions of dollars over this decade into the domestic chip industry, which is going to have a really profound effect. And if we don't do anything in response to that, we're not only going to face a situation where the chip industry is concentrated in Taiwan as it is today, but also where we're going to be even more reliant on chips made in China as well. Right. So, so I guess, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to read your book, but I'm guessing a, a big part of the fight for the world's most critical technology, as you've called it, is is really to ramp up, you know, our our um, you know our uh, sense of importance of this issue. Um, is it your sense right now that the U.S. under uh, the U.S. right now is underestimating this problem? Uh, and I, is, do you yeah. see anything you know positive coming down the line that might change that? Yeah, no, I, I think it's clear the U.S. is underestimating the problem. And part of the reason why I called the book Chip War is that this isn't simply a sort of hypothetical technological question or something that only matters for the speed at which your computer operates. This is something that is profound military applications as well. Because when you think of what makes military systems work today, it's in many cases the electronics inside. And so, for example, uh, when we've taken apart the guidance computers of Russian missiles that have fallen on battlefields in Ukraine, what you find is that they're often full of foreign-made ships, U.S., South Korean, Taiwanese, because the Russian domestically produced ships are so bad that the Russians find it in their interest to smuggle in uh, chips they've bought off the gray market uh, to put in their missile systems. Now, China doesn't have to do that nearly to the same degree because they've got a much more advanced chip industry already. But when both the U.S. military and the Chinese military think about the future of war, autonomous drones, for example, or advanced electronic warfare systems. This is all about semiconductors, processing power, memory capacity, digital signals processing. These are all, um, all only possible with chips. And the better chips you have, the more processing power is available. So it's, it's a chip war in a literal sense, too, in that whoever's got access to the most advanced chips uh, will have better military power and more successful um, battlefield weaponry. And that's, that's why this is a, a real chip war. And that's why I titled the book chip war itself. Right. How do you invest in chips? Say I'm a, per, you know, like I've, we have a bunch of people, um, listening to this podcast thinking, well, gosh, yeah, this is, this is actually a big issue. And the chips are, you know, if I'm thinking about them as a commodity, I mean, it's a lot more valuable than gold for right now. I mean, it's so what, um, I'm not talking about specific companies or stocks, but if you look into uh, this area, like how do you how do you get exposure to that if you're an investor? Well, there are a couple different types of, of companies in the chip ecosystem. There are companies that design chips. Uh, there are companies that manufacture the chips, and then there are the companies that produce the tools with which uh, you you can't uh, we, we, that you need to make chips, and you can't make chips without them. And in the, the tool making, there's a lot of companies that are basically monopolies in their uh, position. And, and so what that means is that they're much less vulnerable to competition uh, and much less susceptible. They still are susceptible to market movements, whereas the companies that design chips and some of the companies that make chips uh, fluctuate much more with uh, consumer cycles. And so right now what we've seen is after a couple of years of um, um pretty sky high valuations in, in, in ship equities. We've seen them draw down um, because there's an expectation of lower consumer spending across the world and therefore fewer smartphones and things like that being bought, which means fewer chips needed. But if you look at the tool makers that are actually making the ultra precise machinery behind this, they've seen less fluctuation um, because demand for their tools is still very strong and their tools will be used not just for years, but for decades in chip making facilities. Got it. Um. So uh, the, the book, again, is called Chip War, the Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. If there are any other messages uh, from this book that you think are you know, worth highlighting uh, that we haven't spoken about? I think the final thing I'd say is that you can't understand trade or globalization without making sense of semiconductors. I mentioned that for Taiwan, chips were 40% of their exports. But what most people don't realize is that for China, chips are no less important for understanding their trade flows. China spends more money each year importing chips than it spends importing oil. 
And so if you're thinking about the Chinese economy, you've got to consider the impact of chips because they're one of the most important in, uh, inputs into China's balance of trade. And so when you look at global trade flows, the global economy, uh, we think a lot about oil, we think a lot about commodity prices, but actually in many cases, chips are even more important and input uh, into the success of economies uh, than commodities we focus on much more frequently. Interesting stuff, Chris. Um, in the, again, the book again is Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology. I'm sure it's available everywhere, Amazon and the usual other outlets. That it is, yes, on Amazon as of yesterday. Okay, great, great. And um, you also have a website, ChristopherMiller.net. What kinds of information we find there? Well, I've got articles, reviews of my book, public events, uh, all on the website. Uh, and mostly focused on on the new book, Chip War. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Chris, thanks again for being on Wealth Formula Podcast, and I uh, would love to have you on again at some time. Great. Thanks for the invitation. Be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. If you uh, went to the meeting, tell me how it went, you know, <laughs> because uh, by the time you get this, um, we'll have returned from the meeting. Hopefully uh, you had a good time. Before we go, uh, you know, as for for people who went to the meeting, people who didn't, there is a way to get more involved with Wealth Formula in the community, and that is through uh, Wealth Formula uh, Network, which is a, essentially a, a course that turns into an online community, and then a you know, in a community that uh, talks on Zoom every other week. Uh, it's very popular. You can go check that out at wealthformularoadmaps.com. Anyway, that's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.